that's what I'm hoping for, that yeah. we can use it in conversations with our students, with our administrators, anybody else who might yeah. introduce the next person. But, well, thank you. All right, uh, allow me to introduce our next speaker, if you'll have a seat, please. Elmerin Wood, PhD, is co-founder of Beyond the Professoriate, a mission-driven organization that provides career education and professional development for graduate students and PhDs. Beyond Prof provides services to individuals and partners with institutions to support their efforts in empowering students and postdocs to leverage their education wherever smart people are needed. In online webinars, on-demand videos, blogs, and an online community, Beyond the, PhD, or Beyond the Professoriate features PhDs with successful careers who share their unique expertise and experiences to support graduate students in their job search and future employment. Beyond the Professoriate is career advice by PhDs for PhDs. Marin has been a lead researcher on several important studies on the academic and non-academic job market for humanities and social science PhDs, working for the American Historical Association and the Chronicle of Higher Education. Her writing has appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside Higher Ed, and University Affairs. Her essay, How to Move Beyond the Professoriate, is part of the edited collection, Succeeding Outside of the Academy, published this fall by University of Kansas Press. A proud Canadian, Marin now lives in Denver. Marin Wood. I tend to wander, so. I have a remote control for your slides down there. Perfect. Happy Thanksgiving to my other Canadians that are here. It's Monday. The joke always goes, it's the day that we're thankful that we're not Americans, but. <laughs> no. Too soon? <laughs> uh, yeah, so let, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, Beyond the Profits right here to give you a little bit about our expertise. For, I did my PhD at Carolina, UNC Chapel Hill. I did a master's degree at Carleton University in Ottawa, and my undergraduate is at the University of Lethbridge. Um, and Jen and I actually met doing our MAs at Carleton. She did her PhD at the University of Toronto in history. We're both historians. Um, we have a learning specialist who's also a PhD from Carleton University. And our undergraduate, or sorry, undergraduate, our graduate um, re, uh, intern that we have is also a historian. So we like to say like we're a woman-owned business, but we're also a historian-owned business. Um, so we started in 2013, both Jen and I moved into the space. Uh, Jen decided not to do a tenure track job search. I actually did. I spent three years on the academic job market from 2009 until 2011. So that was super fun. Um, it was great years to be on the job market. And um, I began to like, you know, when I decided to leave academia because the job, you know, the jobs were just getting worse. There was just fewer of them. Um, uh, my partner, who has an MBA from Duke, uh, we're a divided household, if you know that school. Um, he was like, well, you know, where did, where do other history PhDs go? Like, we lived in Washington, D.C. He's like, this place must be chock full. And I was like, you went to a rich school with an MBA. Like, they tell you where your alumni, alumni is. No one knows. So I actually began to track where history PhDs went, partly just out of my own curiosity, because I was like, if I'm not going to be a historian, what else can I possibly do? And that, um, I published that study in the Chronicle of Higher Education. That led to work with the American Historical Association. And as I was in the space writing and publishing, I could see this person whose name sounded familiar, Jen Polk, who was also doing work um, as a career coach. And so we formed, uh, to our allied, uh, allied together in 2013. And we do an annual online conference the first two weekends in May. Um, and we, we do some of the work ourselves, but we really uh, pride ourselves on Beyond the Professorate being collaborative. So we uh, have PhDs who come in and do webinars. We have career panels. We do workshops, and Jen and I, we host, and so we um, use an extensive network of PhDs. Um, and we're really excited about that. We have an online community for PhDs. Um, we do a lot of online events. It's $9.99 a month for membership, so we try and keep it affordable. And again, so the members can come and, and attend these uh, career panels. Um, new, and I had some flyers out, is actually uh, we're just getting through our final tech issues this week and launching Aurora by Beyond the Professoriate. This is a subscription website for institutions who want to provide professional development to PhDs. Um, on the flyer that says 90, we actually have now added another about 50 PhDs to the platform, um, and we add new content every month. So this is a combination of career panels, how-to seminars, as well as one-on-one -on -one interviews with PhDs. 
And it also just recently, oh, that's the community. It also recently just occurred to us <laughs> that there's not a lot for PhDs who are interested in academic jobs. Um, did I break it? No, oh, it's good. Yeah, we're good. Um, yeah, so this is our online community. Um, but uh, we just realized that there's not a lot of uh, opportunity, or online support outside of institutions for PhDs that are actually interested in academic jobs, and a lot of PhDs want to do that first. So this fall, we're starting a Be a Prof by Beyond the Prof. Um, and we actually have uh, a couple of seminars coming up next week, specifically on the academic job market. Uh, and the philosophy that we have at Beyond the Professoriate right, is we want to empower students to make informed career decisions. Uh, whether it's, you know, a lot of people think that they want to be faculty, we're in the process of actually interviewing faculty to add to Aurora, to our stream, to be like, what is it like to be a faculty member? Um, does it sound at all like what you think it is? Um, because we, and that's also part of the academic job market uh, that we're expanding into because we think that students should be able to hear what it's like to be a market researcher or a UX design researcher or a professor and really be able to do this exp exploration early and often so that they end up in jobs where they feel like it's a good match. You know, we, inter we have faculty members who come to our community because they really, they didn't do career exploration and they don't actually like their job and they're unhappy or they made personal sacrifices that now they don't, they, they wish they hadn't have made. And so we really want students before they take that step to get on the academic job market to really explore their options. So it's a really, you know, and it's all, we're not anti, you know, we're beyond the prof, but it's not only, only beyond the prof. Um, so I wanted to give a little context to some of the data that we saw here. That's the promo piece, done advertising. Um, let's get to the, uh, the research piece. Um, one of the things that I've been working on, just sort of my own, I'm personally really, I'm a historian by training, so I'm personally fascinated into the history of the academic job market. Like, how did we end up where we are and how long has this been going on? And so I've be, I started reading uh, about two summers ago, the Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, and just to start getting this, and uh, just to start getting a sense of like this, you know, the history of the job market crisis. So I want to talk a little bit about that before I get into like where people go, because I think it's really important to understand the, and I guess because I'm a historian, to understand the uh, root of the problem. And one of the reasons why I really want to talk about it is that, and you'll be surprised, that the way that uh, the job market is often presented on, you know, academic Twitter is really divorced from data, from the data that we've been seeing. Um, and I think it's really important for us to really understand the challenges that we have on the academic job market, why we see them, and how long might they be around? How, how long might we be facing this crisis? So let me find my talk. Uh, and this is, of course, gross generalization, um, and, uh, but let's get started. So, um, so as many, so one of the, the things I think is really important to understand about the, the way the academic job market functions is that it's actually very much tied to demographic booms and busts. And so the first real expansion, of course, was after World War II. But if you look at the 1960s, universities actually grew in the United States by 120%. So as much as I like to blame the boomers for everything, because I'm almost a millennial, um, it's actually the people that were hired to teach the, the boomers, right? So to teach the boomers, boomers are coming to college, they ramp up across the United States and Canada. Uh, the university, University of Lethbridge, was started in 1967. So it's a pretty typical story. Across the United States and Canada, they were creating new programs, new universities, hiring and rapidly expanding um, the, the professoriate. The challenge is, that um, oh, there's Cold War spending is increasing science on campuses across uh, the United States and Canada. So defense physics, for example, just explodes in the 1960s. It's important because in 1969 uh, they changed the way in which um, funding. There's a, a, a crisis that begins in academia. It actually starts in physics. It actually starts in STEM. It doesn't actually start in the humanities. And it's because the Cold War begins to change over the 1970s, and the federal government across in Canada and the United States begin to cut funding to universities and institutions. But we see this massive growth um, in hiring, and everybody is given tenure. So you have this locked-in cohort of faculty members all hired in around a 10-year period, all about the same age, and they're all tenured. And then by the early 1970s, you begin to see this demographic shift. The boomers are through college, 
and we don't actually need to keep hiring faculty members, and everyone's, given hope, uh, everyone's been given tenure, and oh my gosh, they're all gonna move through the ranks at the same time. So our payroll is gonna start ballooning as this cohort of faculty begin to actually move through the ranks. So universities begin to stop hiring, there's hiring freezes. And this is really important because people generally stay in their jobs for about 30 to 35 years. On average, a person is about 30 to 35 when they get their first tenure track job. So you have to take that cohort and then add 30 to 35 years, and you begin to see when we actually have the next hiring in the four universities. So you know, in the 1970s, there's a couple of other things. The defense, the way in which universities are funded changes. Uh, physics is hard hit. By 1969, you're reading in the New York Times like about these marauding physicists that can't get jobs. Industry stops hiring for physics. Like it's just an actual crisis. Um, you also have the inflation and energy crisis. So university budgets are just being gobbled up. Um, and there's a lot of stories about you know, universities up here in Massachusetts that actually have to close for extended periods of time because they can't afford to heat the buildings. Um, and they do give faculty raises. Sometimes it's like 7%. And I'm like, wow, that sounds really good. But inflation that year was like 11 or 12%. So any money that's actually going from the state to the universities is just being gobbled up by these other ballooning costs. So you see a real constriction across humanities and social sciences and the number of people that are actually entering the academy in the 1970s through really the early 1980s. The challenge that we don't have, of course, in neither in the United States or Canada right now, is that there is a low unemployment rate. Yes, it's a gig economy, but there are actually lots of opportunities outside of academia. In the 1970s, you have double-digit unemployment rate. And so the real crisis for these PhD programs in the 1970s is like there's actually no place for professionals to go because there's rapid unemployment across North America. Um, but I find this, personally, there's, but um, in history, right, we get um, to start solving this problem, we see the beginning of uh, public history programs. The first public history programs come out in the 1970s. The American Historical Association and the Modern Language Association begin to have alternative career panels in the 1970s, um, about, so about 1974, 1975. So almost everything that we're trying now, these kinds of symposiums, these kinds of conversations, um, uh, Alternative Careers for Humanities PhD is a book I have on my shelf, published in 1980. Um, all of the conversations that we're having, they actually have in the 1970s. And one of the things I'm really fascinated by is um, they begin to create sort of summer boot camps on campuses. One is actually at NYU, uh, run in Stern Business School, um, and started by a Harvard historian, Ernest May. And he, the idea was that they would give people like economic, business, and computer courses, and that they would go and they would bring these faculty members or um, businesses to campus and actually interview these PhDs. And they had like over 3,000 applications for careers in business the first couple of years they did it. And they ran it to about 1987. And if you put careers in business in LinkedIn, you can find people who still list, list that certificate on their LinkedIn profile. It's a really interesting program. And they spent about, it was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, which again is funding all of these programs today. I find it super fascinating. So this, of course, by the 1980s, as if everyone is familiar, there's these rumors that, oh my god, this like, crisis and horror that has happened is going to finally end, and we will, we will finally hire more faculty. And of course, the Bowen Report comes out, and uh, um, he is, of course, the president of the Andrew Mellon Foundation, as well as formerly of Harvard. Um, yeah, and so people, he publishes a story. Oh, sorry, that's where my mic is. Um, and so we have this uh, report that comes out um, that talks about the fact that millennials, so I'm born in like, 19, I'm born in 1980. No one can decide if I'm a millennial or not. Um, but my, I went to college in 1998, that's when I started. So there's, and millennials, of course, as we all know, is the largest demographic in American history, right? That cohort. So they're all gonna start going to college sort of mid 90s. Um, and so there's, and we actually have reached the trough of the number of PhDs that have come out. So you know, people, 
drop out of PhD programs in record numbers. People shutter PhD programs in the 70s and 80s. And so finally, by the early 1980s, you have a decline in the number of PhDs right at the same time that you're going to have this increased or this rumored increased need for faculty. So this report gets a lot of attention. The one person who, the, the one person who says, like, this isn't going to happen is actually Lynn Cheney that Lynn Cheney of those Cheneys. Um, she's president of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And she takes out an op-ed and says, nope, like there's enough PhDs for the jobs that already exist. Uh, we can increase classroom sizes. And there's going to be no need for all of these uh, new PhDs. So you better just like not do what you're going to do. And of course, because who she is and her politics, um, her criticism of the Bowen report was not taken seriously. Um, and I never want to have to tell you that a Cheney is right, but uh, there was some truth to what Lynn Cheney was saying. I think people really underestimated the number of the, how universities were going to increase in balloon class sizes, you know, the faculty to student ratio. But also, re everyone really underestimated um, adjuncts. So we start seeing, really, in the 1970s as a way to sort of um, bring in new energy and new ideas, people begin to, the adjunct becomes a feature of academia in the, really in the 1970s. Postdocs become a feature in the 1970s. There's um, you know, less than three or four percent of STEM PhDs are doing postdocs in the 1960s. And of course now, um, vast majority of PhDs in STEM will do postdocs before they get faculty. And that growth happens in the 1970s as universities try and figure out what to do with these PhDs that can't go into industry because there's no jobs in industry or into academia. Um, I think the first story I read about like this, the plight of the adjunct was 1983, um, and it could have come out of the Chronicle like t you know, tomorrow. It was the exact same thing. Um, so what happens? Well, Lynn Cheney and Bowen, somewhere in the mix is actually the truth of what happened. We actually do see an increased number in faculty. So there's two different things that we have to talk about, and they both, they both overlap. One is, in the mid-90s, you do start seeing people retire. Um, you, because they were hired in the 1960s, you had 35 years, right? You start seeing people retiring in the early to mid-90s. And so by the mid to late, mid-90s to early 2000s is really peak hiring. And at the same time, my generation, the millennials, are going to college. So we're actually, we are actually increasing the number of faculty. So during this whole time, when you're reading these, like, we're killing faculty positions and replacing them with adjuncts, there's almost no evidence that that's true. What we actually have seen is an increase in faculty, both in the contingent as well as on the tenure track. It's just that I've added four apples and I've added 11 oranges. So it is true that a greater share of faculty are contingent, but that's only because we've added 11 oranges. We have also added four apples to our fruit bowl. So it's really like both can be true, and it's really important to note that there was, in fact, an increase in hiring over this time period. So from the National Humanities Indicator, you can see that between 1999 and 2013, they actually increased the size of faculty. That includes both contingent as well as full-time faculty in the United States by 54%. Um, so that's actually quite large. And you can see on this uh, slide here that um, you can see the share between the not tenure and tenure track, the full-time non-tenure track, and part-time. And occasionally, the humanities indicator will break out arts. Um, oftentimes, they say it's statistically or too small, and they um, don't necessarily break it out, but they do. So you, you can look at the humanities indicator for a lot of really cool data. Um, history, 70% of faculty in history departments are, in fact, tenure or tenure track. Um, you know, it's smaller in English departments, so it ranges. So anyways, the point is, we did actually grow the professoriate when uh, Bowen thought we were going to grow the professoriate. Um, this coincides, of course, with enrollment. Uh, Canada looks very similar. I'm sorry I scrubbed my Canadian data out of here, but I do have some. Um, but we had peak enrollment in the United States around 2010, and so we're actually starting to see a decline in enrollment uh, in the United States now again, which, of course, we've ballooned the professoriate. It's exactly the same as the 1960s, right? We've ballooned the professoriate. We've replaced the people who've retired. We've hired a massive cohort, and now they have jobs, and that's great. But what it means is that there's, there's a finite need for faculty, and I can't emphasize this enough, this is why these conversations are so important, is because it probably will be like when you guys retire that we'll start seeing an uh, increase in faculty hirings again. Um, and that's 
fine, but that's just the reality. And you can actually map it, which I think is what's really interesting with what um, the, the data, is that we should actually be able to map, you know, if we start thinking about average age of faculty and the jobs, and so long as faculty positions don't get cut for tenure, we should actually be able to map when um, faculty, like when there might be actually an increase in faculty um, if we wanted to. So this is just a, a chart here that actually shows growth in full-time. This is STEM faculty, but there's also social sciences. So it's not just in the humanities that we've seen an increase in faculty. But the most important thing is like we haven't actually seen a massive decline in faculty and numbers across the United States, just to emphasize that point again for a different discipline. This goes back to um, the, the talk about the age of faculty. So this is a, a chart that Rob Townsend, if you, don't, if you like data, Rob Townsend's at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, but he used to be deputy director at the His American Historical Association, and he's been doing data on the job market for like 20 years. But Rob calculated the average age of history faculty based on a, the directory that they had. And so he thinks, so you can see that right around the time of the job crisis, um, the average age of faculty declines. So what he was seeing is that as the average age of faculty goes up, you actually did see some more increases in job, and now the average age of history faculty is about 48. So it means that, again, we're looking at uh, a fairly young professoriate. Um, and I did a study for what I just talked about on history and English departments in Canada. Um, and it looked fairly similar. Let me see if I have that number. Um, so in the humanities departments, English and history, 60% of tenure or tenure track faculty earn their degrees between 1990 and 2004. So there's just that nice big like 15 year cohort uh, that was hired. And of course, uh, there's just been an increase in the number of new PhDs that have come out. So the reason why it feels like there's a tight job market is because there is more competition for these jobs based on the fact that PhD programs have in fact actually been um, graduating more and more PhDs. So you can see uh, here, you can kind of see the trough here in the late 1970s in some of these disciplines, um, like engineering actually um, declines there for a little bit and now of course it's accelerating. Life sciences takes off, um, education is having uh, a, a crisis um, and the humanities again you peak and you know the important thing is you can also map so you guys are fast you said that it was like five five years to time to degree under six because the average time to degree in the humanities is eight yeah so I was like wow you guys are like you guys are smart ones getting finished fast <laughs> um, so anyways you can also begin to sort of track backtrack to like periods of unemployment so you can see that there's um, the, the real crisis in the 80s, uh, people, more and more people did actually go to grad school, so you had about seven to eight years, and you can start seeing when cohorts begin to, to come out. Um, and so one of the things, um, one of the reasons why there's actually such a uh, number, a large number of PhDs is that a lot of people in 2008, 2009 went to grad school to wait out the recession. So, um, and now they're coming out on the job market right at the same time that there's fewer and fewer jobs. So it's basically 1973 all over again. That's the good news. <laughs> all right, so I'll joke inside. So one of the things that Jen and I do, uh, my business partner Jen and I, is we spend a lot of time interviewing PhDs. We record the interviews. We sometimes lightly edit them. We add closed captioning, and then we like put them up in, various, in our various platforms. So I want to share with you a couple of stories. And I, I want to get to the point of like how PhDs actually find jobs when they leave the professory. Because of course they don't die, always. Um, they go on and have other careers. One of the things that we really, um, I, think, I think I can speak, I was like, I think I can speak for Jenna on this. Jenna and I think we both passionately feel that, um, you know, the, the PhD is a really important education that people can leverage in a lot of ways. But we want you to, I want to caution, and, and we actually wrote a piece in the University Affairs about this uh, based on a response to the University of Toronto's 10,000 PhD pro uh, um, project, not to draw correlation between the PhD and the jobs, right? So just because I run an ed tech company, 
the AHA should not put me up and say, oh, you can get a history PhD and then go off and run this. It's like, well, my brother-in-law works at Google Cloud and calls me and gives me business advice. My partner has a background in IT um, and like, I don't know what I'm doing most of the time. Like, there's actually very little about what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis that directly relates to my education as a historian. That doesn't mean I regret it. That doesn't mean it doesn't inform my thinking. It doesn't mean that it doesn't inform the way that I go about my life. It doesn't mean that I'm not happy I got a PhD in history. It just means that we shouldn't hold up these PhDs and say this is a job for an historian. It's just a job that an historian now has. And I think that's really important to think about, to differentiate between um, where PhDs go and the way they're leveraging their education. And then one of the things I'm really going to emphasize is oftentimes PhDs are leveraging their distractions their non-academic work, and they're pairing it with their skills, and that's actually how they're getting their jobs. And then the other really important thing is networking. Having that community, having that network, and 99% of the PhDs we interview reference networking as critical to their job success. Talking to people, informational interviews, being in the right place at the right time, having an internship, having a part-time job, having their, I'm gonna give you one story, having their, wife's mother's college roommate's husband give them an opportunity. Um, you know, there's a lot of network, you know, we call it nepotism, but that's just how biz business works, right? You wanna hire somebody you know, hiring is expensive, firing is even more expensive, I'm a small company, I hire an asshole, and then they ruin everything and I have to fire them, like I don't wanna do that. So a lot of this, what you're gonna see, and one of the reasons why you see these PhDs outside of the professoriate scattered is that they are leveraging their personal networks, the people they know, the people they can get to know, as well as their outside distractions, paired with their education in order to actually find their careers. So here's some examples, and I've taken some, there's one, if you guys, if you guys have uh, alumni who are doing non-academic jobs who wanna talk to me, we started asking for interviews from like August, and I got two people and one person canceled on me. So I've pulled <laughs> other, history, uh, other humanities and some STEM PhDs for my examples, but we'd love to include arts PhDs in Aurora, so you know, send them our way. Also, if you wanna be interviewed about what it's like to be a faculty member at your institution, well, let me know. So Paige Cooper. Paige Cooper has a PhD uh, in bio, what is it? Um, Cell, molecular cell biology. One of the things that we find at Beyond the Professoria is that it is just as hard for PhDs in STEM to transition out of the academy as it is in humanities and so social sciences. So it's not you, it's just hard. Um, and that's particularly true of people who don't want to go continue to do bench science. If they really don't want to continue to do bench science, it becomes very difficult for them to find their ways. So this becomes a conversation to have with all your colleagues across um, the institution because it is mu as much of a challenge for STEM PhDs as it is for us losers in the humanities. So Paige's story is that um, she's, the, she's now the director of a program at Duke University that supports undergraduate and graduate students who are members of underrepresented groups. Her work involves putting on workshops and mentoring students one-on-one. -on -one. She works in student affairs, um, which might not be an obvious place for a STEM PhD, but she loves it. Um, and what motivated Paige was she didn't, she wanted to work with students. And she did like, she looked around and realized that PI spend all their time running, writing grants and they don't get to spend time with students. Um, and that, that was not what she actually wanted to do. So this is where I think having like, when we're talking about how do we have students figure out what they wanna do, having conversations with faculty about what your life actually looks like and bringing in alumni from institutions that are not R1, not doctoral programs, but actually like four for teaching loads or community colleges, and having them talk about, you know, on the same panel as these as, as other PhDs, like what is it actually like to teach a four for teaching load and live in rural Ohio? Like, is that something that I want to do? What does that look like? Um, and then presenting them with other alternatives, it was like, oh, that sounds really exciting. I actually think that would be fun. So um, Paige, yeah, so she decides research wasn't her thing. Um, so she did a lot of informational interviews, um, and uh, she, oh yeah, so she got this job through informational interviews. So one of the things Paige was doing was she was working a lot, she was taking a lot of initiative in her lab to mentor students, but she also started working at science fairs, um, just like volunteering for high school science fairs to be a judge. 
as one way that she was starting to get experience. And then she did informational interviews and she met somebody who was at Duke who was then able to tell her, hey, like this job is coming up and I think it would be a good fit for you. And they were able to help her with her application. Now, of course, universities have strict hiring policies, so like it's not directly nepotism, but be, knowing somebody on a committee, knowing somebody who can give you advice on an application, and we hear this all the time, right? That that internal knowledge that students get when they talk to people working in those disciplines and fields really makes or breaks their application. And having that person not say, hey, I've got to expect this application from this woman. She seemed really smart and I met her. Um, you know, that goes a long way to getting that person the interview. And we really want to emphasize that, right? Like people don't get jobs through informational interviews, but they get interviewed. Um, they get in front of hiring managers and that becomes really important. And it's so important for PhDs and career transition because we don't have the direct linear work experience that so many people are looking for. So if I can have coffee with you and say, Oh, you know, I, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I've been doing, how would someone like me work at a, an organization like yours? Um, and then I get that feedback from you, and then I'm able to tell you why I'm actually interested in I'll, transitioning out of academia. Well, you can already have that information before you even look and review my, my, my resume, or you can tell the hiring manager that. And so it really gives that student an opportunity to make the case for themselves before they're actually in the running for jobs. And that's really important for getting um, opportunities. Yeah, so Paige just talks about, and this is, I think, one of the things we can talk about, like what can you do for your students? Really encourage them to be distracted. Encourage them to get involved on things on campus. Encourage them to volunteer, to do you know, these community projects, um, to, do apply, to be applied and engaged in their community, to get, build networks but have a different kind of work experience. Get out of the classroom, um, get out of the archives, get out of the libraries, and be engaged in other ways because those stories and that experience can allow them to reflect on what it is they love, when they feel energized, and other places where they could feel similarly energized as the classroom or in research, and that's really important. Okay, Simon Silas uh, has a PhD in theology, um, and he now works at a trade publisher. Um, they actually publish religious books. Um, so Silas started entry level, and this is one of the things that people don't like us to say, but it's true. A lot of the PhDs that we see um, especially out of the humanities and social sciences, do start entry level. And the reason why is that it gives them an opportunity to learn the language of the new industry, how the company works, how does the industry actually work. And so those entry level positions are really important. And a lot of times PhDs won't apply for them because it's like, damn it, I have a PhD, I've worked really hard. Um, I shouldn't have to start entry level. But in career transition, it actually is really important to say yes to entry-level opportunities. Um, and we do find that PhDs rise rapidly. Silas has been in this job for under a year, and he's already been promoted um, from marketing into a combined position of marketing and acquisition with the idea that he'll be put into acquisitions very quickly. So he had to come in, learn the language, learn the industry, but his, because he has a PhD and because he has experience and he has those skills, he will advance. And so the first job is not the last job, and it's okay to start entry level. And we do hear this a lot from humanities PhDs. And so he says, sometimes it takes a low level job, an entry level job to break in, to find yourself doing the kinds of work you'd like to do, sometimes means you have to do work that frankly is perhaps below your skill level, your experience level, to do the kind of work you'd imagine yourself doing. He says, once you're there, you can make significant contributions, you can make real impact on teams, on projects, but you have to give them and yourself that opportunity. And I think it's, you know, it's, a, it's an important story. All right, so Kate M uh, Myers Emery, again, back to this idea of distractions. Um, so she has a PhD in archeology span and anthropology, and now she's a manager of digital engagement at a museum. So, you know, not necessarily obvious how an architect or architect an archaeologist would end up in that position. But she, to pay for her PhD, she did a lot of side hustles. So again, it was like her combination of being a strong communicator, research, being able to tackle um, new projects. You'll be interested to know that one of the things that PhDs from the humanities tell me was one of the most useful pieces of their PhD was actually comps. Because when they exit the academy, they have to learn an entirely new field fast. They have to read themselves into a new industry fast and they have to know how to actually tackle that project for themselves. So being able to be broad 
is way more useful than to be narrow in this job market. And so it's actually not the dissertation that they find most useful for their career transition. It's those damned comps. Which I, and I haven't been asking that, because I've been in rooms, especially we were talking about Canada, I've been in rooms, especially in Canada, where you have a lot of people from uh, the UK system where they don't do comps, and they'll be up against the Americans and Canadians who do comps, and they almost like, uh, where there was almost a fist fight at this one conference I was at over this question. So it turns out it actually is really useful to have your students do comps and coursework if they're going to leave the academy, and it's useful in the academy too, so keep comps. Um, <laughs> so Kate Myers Emery, uh, so, she'd been, so she works in her hometown, that was really important to her. You know, we hear this a lot, people make these decisions. They like being out of the academy because they feel very empowered. They get to decide where they're going to live. They get to decide to prioritize family. They get to decide to prioritize cities that they want to live in or move. And they feel very empowered when they make this decision, eventually. It can be very terrifying, and they don't necessarily always feel supported. But that's one of the constant themes that we hear from the 145 PhDs that we've talked to really in the last 18 months. Um, so now she works at this digital engagement. Um, so she says, the way I got paid for grad school was doing a lot of weird side hustles of revolving around social media and digital engagement. So that practical experience helped her get the job. Um, and then she says, there is so much from doing a PhD that is applied to this position. Both anthropology and social media are about communities. Um, she says, I'm more passionate about the tools that I learned during grad school than I am about the content of what I'm actually doing. And I had the skills needed for this job. It was just thinking about those things differently than I normally would have. So Adam Rubin is another STEM PhD, and he wrote a book called um, Surviving Your Stupid, Stupid Decision to Go to Grad School. <laughs> it's supposed to be ironic. Um, but he actually does a lot of publishing on the side, and he writes for Science Magazine as well. And this is the, this is the networking piece. So again, even though he's STEM, and he, had, he has direct knowledge and technical experience for the job he has that comes from his PhD, but he was only able to get that job through networking. So, um, so, he, the, so the first part of the story is that he actually started going to a malaria seminar in DC where he was doing his PhD, and he said it was really boring and it took him like an hour to drive, but he felt like he should go to these like industry malaria seminars even though he didn't really learn that much. And one day, the CEO of a company stood up and did his research, and it was very similar to the type of work that Adam was doing in his lab. So he met with the CEO and said, you know, I'm really curious, this is what I'm doing. The CEO says, well, you know, we don't have any jobs, thanks so much. Um, and then a few weeks later, uh, his wife's mother's college roommates was in town with her husband, and they said, oh, we're just gonna, you know, we're moving up here because he's just gotten a job at this Bio, like this uh, tech company, or this tech company, this biomedical company um, that, um, that Adam was really interested in. He was like, wow, that's really a coincidence. I just met your CEO. And the guy's like, well, we don't have any openings right now, but why don't you come um, you know, to the Thursday seminars? I'm now in charge of organizing them, and you can talk about your research. So, so uh, Adam did. He showed up, and he did his research. And then a couple months later, there was an opening in the company that was now in the, like, wife's, mother's, college roommate's, husband's uh, um, team, and he asked the CEO if they could uh, rewrite the application. It was meant for a bachelor a BA or BSc, and they said, well, can we rewrite this for someone who has a PhD and actually hire him for the job? And the CEO says, yeah, he seems great. So they rewrote it, and he got the job. So again, even if someone has direct technical work experience and has STEM, that networking piece is so critical to how PhDs get their jobs. And it's, it's critical for how everybody gets their jobs. You know, my partner is in, like, M has an MBA and does consulting, and he only gets gigs through, uh, through networking. I'm almost done. All right, so Rachel, uh, and then we'll talk about what people are doing on campuses. So Rachel, um, she was really interesting because she actually taught, studied women in tech in India, and now she works in tech. Um, but one of the things that she really emphasizes is, again, networking. So she had to create a portfolio when she went to do a career transition. She didn't actually have the direct experience that she needed, so she took online courses from Coursera uh, to learn user research. She did volunteered for Friends in Boulder. She's a CU Boulder grad. Um, she did, <laughs> she did a, a couple of um, uh, free projects for start to Denver and Boulder are very much for tech, so she did a couple of free projects for Friends. And then she got some contract work and in 10 days on that contract, she was actually hired into a full-time job. 
And this position, she saw a piece on LinkedIn about this a Boulder company that had recently been acquired by Cog Cognizant, which is a huge company of 250,000 uh, employees. And this woman in Boulder, her company had just been acquired. And so um, Rachel reached out to her and said, like, I really loved that article you wrote. Uh, this is really interesting and really inspired by your approach to tech. And the woman wrote back and said, oh, you know, we're looking to hire. Send me your resume. So she streamlined Rachel. And Rachel now works at basically the, the accelerator, the think tank of the company. And she says that he, there's so much room for humanities and social sciences in tech. And this will shock you, because most of the time, the people who are putting out the apps and the software don't talk to humans, and they don't interact with humans, and they don't know how to study humans. So the ability to actually like know, be human-focused in your research and being able to be a strong communicator means that there's a, and we, we just did a career panel on, all on user design, um, three women, and they all very much emphasized their research, their ability to do research, their ability to come up with research projects, but also their ability to ask questions to people and be able to listen to people um, and be able to then write about that and take that knowledge back was, a, was, was the transferable skill. And it didn't matter if they were anthropology or education or history. Um, it, that's, the, that's the transferable piece, your ability to ask humans questions. Um, and this is my performing arts. Well, sort of, he got a PhD in uh, cultural studies, a background in performing arts. Omar, he applied to 1,000 jobs. He submitted resumes to 1,000 jobs, and he got nowhere. He got a cup, and this is so important. Resumes are useless unless they're paired with networking. And so he started to do something which I think is really uh, interesting, and there's a, a growing demand in corporations for facilitators, for uh, imp improv, to go into organizations and lead seminars and teach improv as part of team building exercises. Um, and so he started doing that because he couldn't get a job. And he has a background in um, stand-up. And so through this, he was able to build a network and create, again, a portfolio of work experience. And then he, his wife was working as, has a job at a company, and he met the CEO and said, you know, I would really like to do this kind of outreach for your organization. This is how I think that I could fit into your organization, and this is what the position might look like. And the CEO was like, that sounds awesome. You're hired. So Omar actually created his own position. Um, but again, he had to actually develop uh, an outside network and create his own business and establish himself outside of academia before he was able to take that opportunity. So the moral of that story is like outside opportunities, getting people engaged in their communities and having um, uh, and having building networks and having opportunities to demonstrate their skill set in uh, other areas outside of the academy is really important. <coughs> so I have a couple of, of case studies. Um, we do a research and innovation series uh, for Beyond the Professoriate. It's free to attend. And what we do is we ask researchers or faculty or program managers at universities to come and talk about what they're doing on their campus. We did 12 last year. We've got four scheduled for the semester. We'll do another six. They're Thursdays at noon. They're online. We record them. They're available afterwards. Um, so a lot of these that I'm going to talk about are from that uh, research and innovation series. Um, so this is Carleton University. Carl and the sociology department. Um, they're really interesting. So they're actually, they're not actually, their sociology department at Carleton is one of the top, top ranked in Canada. Um, they're one of the large sociology PhD granting institutions. But they are seeing, as everybody is, a challenge in having students get tenure track jobs. So what they actually ended up doing is they started a professional development program. And they hired a postdoc, a woman who'd come out of their PhD program. And they created a, like a part-time administrative position as well as a teaching position. So a lot of the funding for her position came through her teaching undergraduate classes. But they were also able to get the department. They were, not, they were unable to get money from the grad school. They actually came up with the money from their own department to then pay for part of her time to be focused on developing a professional development program. Um, they have a Facebook group where uh, Kara posts a lot of jobs that come through. Um, and part of her job was actually finding jobs that PhDs could potentially apply for and posting them on Facebook. One of the key things that Kara did um, is, you know, she found partners on institutions, uh, on campus, to bring into the department. And that's really important. We know from research that has been done that students 
want professional development from their department. They don't want it from the graduate school necessarily. They will not go to career services. They do not see career services as something that's for them. They, the, they, even though you might not be the best person to tell them about jobs outside of the academy, they want you to. That is what they're expecting from their department. Now there's a mismatch there, but having, creating these types of like opportunities for a new PhD out of your department, or even a PhD in your department, to bring resources from campus to the department. Um, she created, she brought alumni back. Ottawa is, uh, is like, what is Washington DC, basically. So there's a lot of PhDs working in think tanks and government that she was able to bring back and do talks on campus. Most, what is most interesting to me about uh, Carleton's sociology department's program is that they, they opened it up to people who'd been out for three years. Um, because so often when PhDs leave their departments and they don't get academic jobs, they go into this wasteland where they don't feel necessarily attached to any particular community, and it becomes very difficult for them. And they were trying to support PhDs both in academia as well as outside of academia. So one of the things the department did was they figured out how to sponsor library privileges for alumni up until three years after. Because they found, of course, that if you're a contingent faculty and you're trying to do research or all of your um, independent artists, being able to publish and write becomes incredibly difficult when you lose your library privileges. So that was one of the things that they were able to do for their um, students. Um, they had networking events on campus where they would brought, brought organizations in, um, and so they facilitated those conversations right on campus um, and within the department as well. So finding people, bringing them in, having conversations and creating that. And it wasn't faculty that did that. I want to emphasize that. They did find money from the department, but they created this position for a recent PhD. And Kara now actually has, has transitioned out of this job, and she's now working at a think tank in Ottawa and loves her job. And she talks about this job that she got from her department as being really critical in getting that job because she was able to do program management, project management, she was able to d develop a lot of skills. So not only was it really good in that she helped other, p other her fellow students, but she was also given an opportunity in her department to basically work in an all tax position. So um, we, uh, this is uh, University of K uh, Kentucky. Oh, so, uh, Kara said in her interview, I just wanna emphasize this, that having this professional development program in place became really central to recruiting, and students were, uh, prospective students were really fascinated and interested in the fact that from day one they felt more supported by their department in finding the career, and it also was really important in retention of students. So they saw dropouts decline, that people stayed in the program longer, they were able to continue to recruit students by celebrating and supporting all career paths. Okay, so University of Kentucky Graduate School. This is a little different. I've got a couple of department examples and a couple of kind of more graduate level center program examples for you here. So this is a preparing future professional. So you have preparing future faculty. This is a course at graduate school. Um, and Nathan Vanderfort is the man's name who does that. He's uh, assist, he was a vice, vice president um, uh, of academics. So it was a, and I think that's another avenue for departments is to actually reach out to the PhDs working on your campus and invite them to help you create future professional courses or maybe even teach the future professional courses um, as an adjunct. A lot of the people that we interview love teaching. Um, so I think that you probably would be able to find somebody just even on your own campus um, who would be really excited and interested to work with you and other departments in creating you know, humanities focused future professionals course. Um, the importance of this course for Nathan was that he wanted to begin to change culture in his department or in the department in the university by having these conversations. So again, he talked about like the fate of the job market, it's biomedical, it's way worse for them, it's only 10%, feels good about your 38, you're doing better than biomedical. Um, and so, and he wanted to, you know, it, it showed an investment in career development structures and uh, established um, connections with employers. So it's a 16 week course and the students get two credit hours for it. Um, the course is designed to talk about the reality of the job market, to learn what skills are required to tra transition to other uh, careers. Um, they have to identify resources themselves that will help them. And the students have to create an action plan for a non-academic career as part of this. They're also, so the course is structured around career exploration, where the students are, they, they read about other, you know, science and science careers. Um, they focus on transferable skills. Again, Nathan works with the uh, 
um, career center for some of these as well, so he doesn't teach them all himself. And the students are required to do informational interviews. They're required to find somebody who has a career that they're interested in and interview them, and that doesn't preclude them from talking to a faculty member. So if they think that they want to work as a PI, they should go interview PIs and learn what that's like. Um, so we build that right into the program. And then they talk about um, job application skills. So they learn resume writing in that course as well. Um, yeah. So publicly engaged scholarship is another way in which uh, departments are, are facilitating these connections between students and learning uh, non, you know, skills that can help them find, succeed outside of the academy. So Molly McCarthy did a great one-hour web workshop for us on their public engage, publicly engaged scholarship program. This is out of the Humanities Institute at UC Davis. So again, there might be other places for you to, to especially people with smaller PhD programs, to partner um, to develop these kinds of things. So they, this is funded by the Mellon Foundation. Um, and so they have fellowship for 10 public scholars. And Molly was really interesting because they, when she started this program, she started push, not pushing, but she started offering workshops on non-academic careers, and students wouldn't come. Now, when the, when humanities students are in, are interviewed about their career choices, 80% will say that they want to be faculty members. So one of the things that Molly has really tried to do with this program is to reach students where they're at. So one of the reasons it's called publicly engaged scholarship instead of internships is that the students want to do publicly engaged scholarship and they don't feel like it's a stigma if they want to take their scholarship into the community. The same way it might be stigmatized on an academic job search if they were to say like an internship. So it's, it's, it's marketing, but it matters, as with all things in marketing. It's open to both humanities and social sciences students, um, and uh, they have a part-time program manager who runs this. They teach a spring seminar, so it's a, and then the students complete their, um, their projects over the summer. So it provides them with much needed summer funding, uh, and it also then doesn't necessarily conflict with their time to degree, which as you know from the eight years, uh, average for human, uh, their other humanities programs, uh, time to degree is, becomes a real issue. Personally, I think time to degree is like, not really that interesting. Like if you're, if you're graduating PhDs who then struggle for three to five years, that doesn't necessarily seem like that's as good as adding another year to a program if the year then accelerates full-time meaningful employment. Like I think there's other metrics that we should be thinking about other than like the graduation rate. And I know that there's funding and budget issues that like limit that conversation, but I think that that's you know, an interesting, important thing. So they all have community projects. Some of the students uh, create their own projects. That's much easier for social science PhDs to do than they found for humanities PhDs. Because humanities PhDs, I think they really do struggle to think about how their skills can be applicable outside of academia. So one thing we see from like UBC has done a really great study. Where's my UBC per? Yeah, UBC has done a really great placement study of their PhDs. I know the University of Toronto has done this. Um, the AHA and the MLA, one of the things we see is that humanities students want to stay in higher ed or they default to higher ed. So they're contingent, they go into higher ed administration or they go into faculty positions. But we see a very small percentage of humanities PhDs moving into industry at all. I think it's a problem, like I think industry is obviously great, I'm in it. Uh, there is a lot of need for humanistic thinking in industry uh, and the ethics of humanistic thinking. But humanities students tend to want to stay in higher education. And we see that across all of this data. Um, so one of the challenges that humanities PhDs have is they don't know how their skill sets can translate. So what they have done at, uh, at UC Davis is they've actually found partners like the California um, Arts Council, for example, or the California Department of Education. So places that are government or mission-driven organizations, and the partners actually will suggest um, internships, basically, public, publicly engaged scholarship um, for the students. And so half of these spots, half of the 10 spots are open for students to have their own projects, and the other half are basically sponsored projects. They are, they don't have, the organization doesn't have to pay for it, but they have already come up with the scope of the project, and they advertise those, and the students can then apply to actually take on those projects. So the projects are very digital humanities focused, uh, the ones that Molly <coughs> shared with us. A lot of them are like building websites, doing interviews, and then publishing the websites, those kinds of things. Um, another uh, UNC Chapel Hill history department where I did my PhD, 
they, their funding is, is interesting. So I worked with them to do their data tracking, and you guys seem to have lots of it already. And they were actually able to take departmental uh, data, the tracking data that I did for them, and go to the grants office and work with the grants office to get a donation specifically for the department to fund internship programs. So they have gone, they don't have an outside funding agent, they have gone completely outside of the graduate program and they've actually managed to secure their own grant um, to do this. And they, were, they did that by saying, help us. This is the state of the job market, this is what our students need, your gift will help our students in this way. So they're able to use that data to make a specific ask. And so they have a grant that supports four PhD students, again in the summer, it's $3,000 the last time I heard um, that the student gets, and they do it over a couple of weeks. And when I went to check on what, so when I went to check and see what the students were doing, all four students that had been sponsored this past year were all doing intern, well, three of them were doing internships on campus. They were doing internships in um, the special collections, or they were doing uh, internships within university uh, departments. One student was actually doing an internship at a local museum. But they were all local, they didn't require the students to travel, and they were engaged even within the own, their own institution. And to go back to the, what I was saying, like a lot of humanities students really want to stay in higher ed. They like them, it's, it's a mission that they believe in, it's a place where they feel like that their skills have particular value. And so I think that humanities programs have a real opportunity to create partnerships just on campus, you know, with student affairs or with your GSA, um, to create opportunities that can fund internships just with, without having to have students travel or even go off campus because students really actually are interested in that career path. And I think it could be a really interesting thing for you all to explore on your campuses that would meet students where they're at. And then if they decide to move off of campus, that's great, but there's a lot of opportunities um, just even within the university that could be really fruitful for students. Um, and, you know, fudging some funding with your grad school, you know, on RA ships or how these positions are paid, you know, that could be an interesting conversation to have as well, to work just within the budgets of the university to create these kinds of positions for work that already needs to be done. So that's my last, that's my last one. And with Carolina. Um, so yeah, questions. I know that was a lot and I went fast. Thank you so much for that. That was hugely helpful. Um, I, I, have a, I want to go back to something that you mentioned really quickly in this, um, which was the reluctance that students have to go to campus-wide events around this. Can you talk about, a little bit about what drives that? Because I know one of the things that I've been trying to do on my campus is talk to my dean inside of Arts and Humanities about handling this on the divisional level, because our program cannot possibly be the only program that's facing this, yeah. and so how, and other students in other programs must have similar problems and desires, so how can we work together on this instead? Right. So can you talk about what's driving that reluctance so we can figure out how to actually induce the students so that we're not reproducing all of this labor on a departmental level. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, just to add to that, because um, I was on board with you 100% until that moment where I thought, well, because I'm also wondering about perhaps a perceived mixed message that we might be sending our sure. students about, you know, this is what we're training you to do, but either some of you aren't going to cut it or you probably won't like it <laughs> or whatever it is, right? So I want that, to push back you know, on training. Tra are you training or are you educating? Well, I can see tr training and, uh, in terms of um, sort of ancillary professional positions, right? So being an artistic director or, or doing um, other kinds of work in theater and performance that's mm -hmm. not in a tenure track position. But if we're also going to be teaching them how to be accountants and how to be, you know, how to be in tech or something like that, how is that, one, I can't do it, but also how is that, you know, what does that conversation look like? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm putting this up because one of the, we talk to career services about this, you know, this new option. And one of the things we talk about is they, they, they know it, humanity students don't show up. And I don't necessarily, there's a number of things that we hear from uh, career services. Um, we just want, like, this is an anecdote. Uh, the Humanities Institute at the University of Winnipeg 
paid for Jen and I to come up, and it was full of engineers. <laughs> and like, like they were like, we had two historians to come talk to you in the Humanities Institute. It's like humanities for humanities and humanities for humanities, and they still wouldn't come. And so I think it, part of it comes, I think why Molly's is so interesting, Molly's approach is because, you know, survey your students and find out what their um, career plans are. And when she did that, right, like 80% of the students were like, nope, faculty or bust. And she was like, right, but math, you know, like that's not gonna be the way it works. So that's why, you know, um, there's other things that you can do in departments or even working with um, on campus. And I know a lot of graduate programs be have begun to do more things like research ethics. So that's something that doesn't necessarily sound like I have to have a non-academic career but it could, or grants writing, which is another one, which could be applicable to an academic or a non-academic career. So trying to be strategic about those kinds of like how you're, what you're calling them. Um, you could even do like a professional development document, like just talk about applications and just label it that and then sneak in some resume writing as part of that. But I think it really, they, they don't want to not be faculty. Like that's the biggest problem that we have with humanities PhDs is that there are a lot of them, vast majority of them are coming to PhD programs because they want to be faculty. And you know, I mean, I joked with the chair of the department, you know, when I did that data forum, I said, you know, if you would have showed me this data when I was a grad student and would have said like 40% of you, only 40% of you will get tenure track jobs, I would have said that's too bad for Robin and Philip. Like it would never have occurred to me that I was gonna be the person that wasn't gonna get that job, right? Just would not have, like I'd, gone to, like I'd gotten all my grants and I was like top program and I thought I'd made it and I was like, you know, whatever. I guess I was arrogant, I was young, I don't know. But I was also getting fed that message, you know, from my faculty mentors, like, well, you're like, this work is so great and you're gonna be fine and you're doing all the right things and it's blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I think that if there's also a way to require I mean, I know that that becomes a, a problem with cre like credit hours, and there's lots of issues around that. But requiring some kind of professional development or working it into a pedagogical course. I know Carolina's done this. They actually have now a required course that students have to take where they talk about historians in the profession. And they talk about all historians, not just the ones that end up working as historians. Um, and so they try and sneak it in whenever they possibly can. Um, I think the other reason why the sociology uh, example from Carleton is so interesting, and what Jen and I see all the time is we, we thought we would be working much more with grad students, and we see almost no grad students. We see people who are three, five, seven, 20 years out, who then will come. Um, they'll be sessionals for like 10 or 15 years before they realize it's not gonna become a contingent fact, like a, a job. So this is why I think the data of like how long are people on the job market, and like, when should you leave? Like with the, from the study I did from the Chronicle and the humanities, it was like uh, two years, three at the max. Like, and that includes your ABD. And then there was like nobody getting hired unless they were tenure track faculty making lateral moves. So it's like a really short window of opportunity. And I think making sure students know what that opportunity is um, so they can make strategic decisions and opening up your department offerings to uh, students who are in and around your school who are now out can be really important and facilitating that kind of work for them, including them in your conversations. So, yeah. One of the things that I find interesting in the comparisons with a lot of the humanities things that you're citing is that it's not a cultural thing that people generally grow up as a kid or develop as a teen thinking, I'm gonna be a historian. But there is this identity issue with theater that I'm a theater person. And I think that's unique to our field. I think that, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm overstating that, but I think it's more so than anthropology or a lot of other, maybe not, I don't need to argue that point so much. But one of, I just wanted to note that because I think that is something. People wanna stay in theater. And um, the other thing that was interesting to me was how to manage the amount of shame and fear around it because we make certain types of decisions when we're ashamed and when we're afraid and we don't use logical decision-making you know, patterns when we're in these states. And I think that they're already so ashamed and afraid as PhD students because it's, there's a lot of shaming mechanisms that are in place that have been, we've all inherited from you know, generations and generations that we're trying to dismantle to make it a more supportive experience, but still rigorous and still tough. So I feel like part of this thing is like getting people to show up and even consider this idea of what they're perceiving of as failure, 
while they're even doing it is such a funny thing and how to couch it as not failure when that's really what they wanna do because you know what, our jobs are so fun. It's so cool to be a theater professor. It's, it rocks, like it's, I can't imagine a better job. And they see that, it's a great job. So I don't know, like, sure. and I know that that's like, they see other things, they could do other things too, but I guess I just wanna bring that in of like, acknowledging that it's um, shrouded so, in a lot of this. So here's my, questions for, here's my question for you. What is it about being a theater professor that rocks? Like what actually motivates you and excites you about the work you do? The ability to work with students, the ability to do my own creative work and research, and then the ability to do performance. It's okay. like crazy to so get to be able to do all three. What is it about working with students that you love? They invigorate me. I love touching the future. So it's like the future piece. The, yeah. yeah. I mean, I didn't think about it too heavily. There's probably right. more. Yeah. So like that's the kind of work that we do with humanities social science students because um, you know, like I, I loved, I mean, you say like theater and I also have a background in theater, but like I loved history. Like I read like, you know, Anne of Green Gables, well, I'm Canadian. I read Anne of Green Gables and thought I was Anne. Like I had red hair and I talked a lot and I was adopted. Like I was Anne Shirley. But like I was always fascinated with that. And so getting to go to a history department where there were other nerds, like I think this is part of the appeal of the academy for so many people is like you're a dork in high school and then you go and you're like rewarded for being weird. You know, like all of a sudden you get to talk about like, you know, I mean, I read, you know, did porno you know, pornography in the 18th century. Like I did the most useful, useless dissertation, but I loved it. I loved my, you know, queer studies and having these esoteric topics and being around other smart people. But what the work that we have to do with students is that why, like what was it about history that was actually really exciting to you because, or, or what was it about my dissertation that was actually really exciting to me? And so what I've actually figured out about myself running a business is I love strategic thinking and problem solving. I love it. Like I actually hated going to the archives. Like if someone had actually pointed out how little time I spent in the archives, it might have been a really good clue that I probably wasn't gonna succeed as a professor. I love teaching, so I do this, you know, or I do these online workshops. So. And what, what I love about teaching is was motivating and mentoring other people to be successful. That's actually what I really loved about it. So if we take what motivates us in the work that we do, like what is it about theater? What is it about performance? What is it about working with students? Like what's that hook? And when we help students realize what their hook is, then they begin to see other opportunities and they can have conversations with other professionals who can talk to them about like similar motivations and then I get similar satisfaction. Because the interesting thing about all of these, uh, we did, so we have 20 career panels, we have three to four people on them, we did 40 one-on-one -on -one interviews with PhDs this last summer, and every one of them say that about their job. I love my job, I love it. This is the best fit for me, I'm so glad I'm in it. And I think like we have to have people come in and say that, like I didn't, like it was, I'm really energized by the work that I do now in a different way and this is what the hook is. The other reason why having students do that work of figuring out why they're there and what they love is because that, that's what you tell people in informational interviews, right? Like, what, because you have to make, draw, like, because you're 35 years old and you're doing this, so you have to be able to say, like, so as a university researcher and educa an educator or as, you know, a director, what I really loved doing was this. And now I'm looking for an opportunity where I can continue to do that kind of work just in a different capacity. So really doing that deep dive, that like career coachy, like reflective exercises, even before you get to transferable skills, thinking about what the hook is and why, like, I, and I talk to people about this all the time, you're not in theater because it's theater. There's something that's, that you're experiencing in theater that allows you to explore things that are really important and passionate to you. And, and, and if we can articulate that, then we can begin to find other avenues. I would just call out to this group then to say, if we have aspirational people who are our graduates, who are those people, I would love for them to get interviewed by this because I think of our grads who aren't in this academic position, and I think most of them would say they settled. One was had a corporate job because he was going through a divorce and he needed to, you know, and he held out for a year. And another one is doing a center administrative, but I don't think, so I think finding wildly fulfilled people who did this would be great. Yeah, I mean, we, they, well, they come to us, like we, they, they volunteer to be interviewed, so we, I guess we self-select, but we, we know 
hundreds of happy, fulfilled PhDs. Um, thank you for your presentation. I just had a question about the timeline of, of this because it occurs to me that we could counsel people out of the PhD before they finish the dissertation. Yes. And do you need to finish the dissertation? I mean, do you find that people are needing no, the degree to do what they're doing? No, 100% not. 100% not. Like, no one wants to hire a history PhD or an English Lit PhD. 100% the credential does not matter. 100% the credential does not matter. But it's a credential. That doesn't mean that the skills don't matter. So people, one of the questions we ask, right, and that's the thing you have to remember about it with like in industry, right, is that industry positions hire people based on a whole variety of work experience and education. So the fact you have a PhD and someone else has like a master's in public policy, eh, I don't really care. What I'm hiring is, are you a good fit? Do you have a skill set that's unique? Can you build my organization? What's your particular value? And so helping students understand, again, going back to what um, Rachel was saying about the humanistic approach that she's able to bring to her research and the ability to even create a research project is a highly transferable skill. Being Wanting to build community, wanting to engage with people, wanting to inspire people, uh, wanting to get people up to interact with each other. You know, you think about like, why do, why do corporations spend, like, I guess I'm on camera. I mean, my husband went to like do like this improv thing. It, the, the company spent $50,000 to spend two days to send their employees to do improv. What is it about that experience of, of performance and getting people to engage that is about, so that like businesses are paying lots of money to have this come in, like have this kind of facilitation happening in their organization. What is it about that? Um, and I think that that's where, and I know you all are busy, but having informational interviews yourself with organizations and businesses that are in your area, figuring out what the major employers are and having conversations with them about what they do can actually begin to have, um, uh, so the, to go back to your point, like I think it goes, there's lots of reasons why people get PhDs. I think it's perfectly fine. I think it's an amazing education. And I think that I personally push back against sort of this neoliberal argument that there needs to be a direct connection between someone's degree and what they do, you know? <laughs> like I just, it's, it's bullshit. You know, and so we're educating people. You are, right? I'm, I am too in different ways, but you're educators and you do it so well. And you have smart, talented, interesting, bright people. And to go back to the shame piece, like for me, that's the most destructive part is that I see people languish three, five, seven years in these contingent faculty positions or they're basically unemployed, you know? Like, like you would look at this data and you look at it for history in English too, the underemployment rate of PhDs is staggering. The unemployment rate is low because they're smart, ambitious, creative people and they're like busy. But the underemployment rate of PhDs is staggering. And a lot of it comes from this lack of ability to see how they fit into, um, you know. And so I think the conversation becomes not about training PhDs, but about leveraging your education. Like what is it that you, what, what brought you here? Why are you excited? Okay. Um, and talking about timing, I think it's never too early to, for students to do informational interviews or, you know, internship programs have been really highlighted. To have that experience, I think doing it early, doing more than one, finding opportunities for students to engage. The other thing I'll, I'll, I'll say, as somebody who's gone into this world, is like, you very quickly begin to see your skill set when you're up against other people who don't have it. But when you're in a world where everyone operates like you, you're like, oh, well, everyone's smart at this. You know, and you're like, actually, most people are really bad at project management. Most people suck at it. But you got out of bed and you put your pants on and you wrote your dissertation and you funded it <laughs> and you finished it. Like, you're actually really good at it, right? That's awesome. Most people can't do that. Like, I talk to people all the time. And they're like, oh, you work for yourself. It must be so hard. And you're like, why? Like, I set my alarm, I get up, and I work. What, what do you do? Um, but, you know, having that self-motivation is something that really stands out. So the more interaction students can have, outside of people that are like them, outside of academics, the more they will see the value of their skill set and the way in which it can bring, and that's the most important thing, right? Employers hire people who bring value to them. It's not about the student, it's not about the student experience. It's knowing how you make the organization more awesome and how your skill set can build up and help that organization achieve its mission that becomes really critical on the job search. Um, but yeah, so that's, I guess, that's my little rant. I don't, it doesn't matter what you do with the PhD. Like, getting it is one thing. And then you, if you want to go do, like, fly fishing tours in Montana with your PhD, awesome. Like, I don't know. Like, I think that that's a challenge, right, of, like, 
And I, I say that because I'm out, and you guys have the pressure of funding your programs and demonstrating viability of the degrees in a very neoliberal university, so that's a different challenge. But I, I, so, I think so we should push back. One quick comment from Twitter before I uh, oh. pass things on. Uh, Donatella Galella of UC Riverside just notes, I wish there was an acknowledgement of how racial, class, and gender privileges shape our networks to not only obtain a job, but to hear about a job on the, in the first place. So this is, yeah, so um, one of the challenges that we have in interviewing PhDs is that so few PhDs uh, are, you know, so few people of color actually get PhDs. And then we see a even smaller percent that actually end outside of the academy. But one of the motivating factors that we, one, one thing that we do actually hear from PhDs of color who leave the academy is the alienating experience of being in academia and that they want to leave it because they don't feel like it's a place that, that, that where they ex are, are rewarded or excelled and they're in predominantly white programs. So we have heard that. Um, the thing that I wanna say about networking, and uh, like, you know, um, this is a challenge, especially I think for um, Canadian schools uh, where I've had a lot more of these conversations because there's a much higher percentage of international students in Canadian schools. And of course there's the issue of race and racism in hiring um, a lot of the international students. Um, you know, so now you can build your own network, you know, and hearing about jobs, you say that. It's, it really is about um, finding organizations of interest, finding people who work at those organizations of interest, and yes, it means you have to cold call them in order to have coffee. Um, and that's the same. Now, there will be more limitations for women, right, of especially women with children, or there's the same issue of job searching when you're pregnant in the academy as outside of the academy. Um, that's a challenge, and of course, there is a, uh, the challenge of, um, you know, just racial discrimination in hiring, um, you know, and there's not much you can do about that, but the informational interview is a way that you can actually um, begin to find places where you will succeed, um, and, and, and there are professional associations that are out there that focus specifically on, especially in, you know, cities with larger, demo, uh, uh, larger populations of African American, there are, like, centers that are specifically, like, entrepreneurship, uh, business for women, uh, businesses for people of color, LGBTQ, um, and connecting into those networks, I think, can be really critical and important. Um, there's a lot of uh, business, there's a lot of opportunities for women in business, or there's a lot of organizations to promote and support women in business. Um, as well, so I, that would be my suggestion. And the, the value of informational interviews is that you can quickly ascertain in informational interviews, um, you can ask that question, like what is the percentage of people of color that work at your, you know, do you sponsor, do you sponsor people with H-1B visas? And having those conversations can actually help students find places and organizations where they will, well, where they will thrive because you don't wanna work for racists or misogynists, right? So having those conversations about uh, culture in informational interviews allows the student to actually do interviewing themselves of places where they will thrive. And that's really important in the job search. It's not just about finding a, a, someone who will hire you, it's about finding a place where you, that will match your interests and, um, and where you will succeed. Um, and so informational interviews is 100% important for, for that as well. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the, uh, uh, the earlier comment uh, about uh, uh, this job rocking and so on. I mean, uh, uh, um, yeah. I might not state it in those terms, but I actually agree with that <laughs> emphatically. And, uh, yeah. uh, and the students that I have uh, uh, interaction with and that I have the privilege of mentoring uh, feel strongly as well. Uh, what surprises me is when I was raising my kids and I was standing in Northern Virginia on the edge of soccer field uh, uh, with other parents, many of whom in the Washington DC area are, are lawyers. Uh, uh, and uh, and our intellectuals, uh, uh, and they would uh, talk to me about my job, and I and uh, and inevitably they would say, "You have a very cool job, right? I wish I had your job." And I, I would ask them why they wanted my job, and uh, uh, it's because their intellectual activity, and this is almost a direct quote from them, always came down to billable hours, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and much of what I do uh, as a as an academic and as an intellectual. Uh, uh, much of what my students uh, 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 are doing as well and the mentorship that goes on between the two of us actually uh, 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 boils down to not just the practice of theater, 
but developing uh, 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 ideological strategies to deal with a society that wants to boil everything down to billable hours. And, uh, uh, and, and that's the ideological dilemma that we find ourselves in, in training our students, is training them in that ideological perspective uh, uh, and then sending them out in a job market where they may not be able to uh, um, uh, sustain the ideological convictions that they themselves have developed as intellectuals and practicing artists. So, so my question would be with regard to yeah. the, the, um, the program that you have here is, um, I mean, is this something that is available uh, by subscription through, um, through my university? Can I give, so this uh, is, this or, or is it something that happens, do my, st how do my students interact with this? Sure. Uh, so this is just new, like it's coming online Monday, we hope, Tuesday okay. possibly. So we have had conversations with about 20 institutions. Um, we've got four that are saying that they want to sign up. We've got another 10 that are in the works, so it's, it's just brand new. Um, students are able to join our community where we do events every month um, for students. We do two open discussions where they can talk about fears, dilemmas. We do, basically it's group coaching, but they can attend and we talk job search strategies with them. We have uh, webinars every month on different types of jobs. This month it's on marketing. Last month it was on user X research. We've done stuff on data science. Um, and we just, anyways, and then we also have a, a library that they can rent things that are of interest to them. Um, so we try and keep the price as low as possible because we know students have no money. Um, and so that they're able to sort of choose resources that are available to them. But yes, we would love to get institutions to subscribe to this so that the students can have access to it while they're on campus. Um, to go back to the question about billable hours, most or, so yes and no. I think most businesses are small, and most businesses are see themselves uh, in the habit of solving problems. So they see that there's a need. Now, maybe it's an industry, like an industry-specific need, or in my case, a professional, like I'm mission-driven, right? So I haven't had a paycheck in 18 months. Hope that changes soon. Um, and so I'm building something because I really believe in the mission of Beyond the Profit Story, and I think this is really important. And there's a lot of founders that do that, right? They build things that are mission-driven to solve problems. Um, the idea would be that you would be able to like make a livable wage, potentially pay yourself and pay other employees. Um, in terms of billable hours, like that's often the outcome. But so on my first date with my now husband, he just, had just finished his Duke MBA and I was like, I don't know about this guy. Like I was like, and I, and I sat and I requested from him and I said like, what, you know, so why did you get your MBA? Um, and he said, most people spend their lives in organizations, like in, in organizations, in businesses. Like the most of their waking hours are in these businesses. And most businesses are dysfunctional. So if I can come in to an organization and help them be more functional, I make people's lives better. And that's what I want to do. I want to improve people's lives. So like, yes, the company that he works for pays him based on his billable hours. But for him, what actually motivates in his, him in his work and what he sees his work doing is actually building and supporting the people in organizations to have better, less stressful lives. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of nuance in that. I don't know for lawyers. <laughs> but you know, going back to like the mentoring and the conversations, um, you know, the startup world is very fast paced, you know, and I talk about this because I just was at Denver Startup Week, which was an entirely free conference that was completely sponsored and you could just go to anything and everything was awesome. Um, but like all the content was amazing. It was all done by these experts who were just volunteering their time. But you know, a lot of it's very fast paced and a lot of it, one of the, and a lot of it is very, again, about solving problems and chuck and doing research and chucking it and seeing how it goes and then like coming back, you know, it's called agile, right? So you like see how it goes and you come back and you make changes and you go and you, and so there is actually a lot of like intellectual engagement just in different kinds of questions. To talk about gender and race, like having those components and being able to come into organizations and be able to offer that perspective can make you very employable and very hireable. Um, having an international focus within like the tech world can actually make you very employable and very hireable because not a lot of people have that. Um, so uh, the other thing is to like think about what happens in organizations. So like to be a good leader is the same as being a good teacher, right? So if you're a project manager or if you're building running a team, making sure that your team feels supported, making sure that people have goals that they're trying to achieve, mentoring people into their roles. Um, a lot of the people that we talk to who love teaching and have left, love that part of their job. They love being like team leaders. They love mentoring. Um, and a lot of times they also have interns that come in 
And so they get to actually work with like high, high, or not high school, they get to work with undergraduates and even college age students still one-on-one -on -one in internship programs. Um, and they, I think they gravitate to those like types of opportunities and positions. So the same things that make you really strong as a teacher can actually make you really strong as a leader in an organization and allow people to excel. And we hear that a lot from people. Yeah, I, I had a question about the whole idea of the importance of distractions and, and, yeah. and part of the conversations that we've had uh, in our department is about the ethics of taking less students, funding them fully, and and pushing to com have them complete in four years so that they they don't go further into debt and so that they're, yeah. uh, and so that we can actually fully fund them throughout the process. And that involves limiting their side projects and distractions, telling them to do research over their summer so to know what they're doing early in, in advance so that they can get it done in four years, which is a short time to get a PhD done. So we're just wondering about your thoughts in terms of the relationship between that and the, the idea that that these other possibilities of, of careers will come actually from the distractions and side projects that we're telling them not to do so that they can finish as quickly as possible. Yeah, I mean, like that's the UK model, you know, people get, you know, come in and do PhDs and then they're out by like 27, you know, and, and, and they have less debt and maybe that's, fine, uh, like I don't, I mean, I don't wanna say like people should languish and suffer in grad school <laughs> longer, um, but it's not helping, like, so I think that that, it doesn't help people get jobs, right? So I guess the question becomes, um, are, there, are there ways in which your program could set people up for, um, like maybe there's an internship model that comes after the degree, you know, like maybe there's a way in which you could graduate in four years and then actually go spend a year or at the summer after that doing an internship um, after you actually finish. Like there could be some really creative ways where you still build in distractions. Um, there's also ways, I guess, in which we could model like the time in classes, right? Doing some of these um, digital humanities projects, actually building them right into the program where students are developing portfolios as part of earning their courses so that they're developing like podcasting, right? Like that's all the rage. Social media, it's really, you know, social media and marketing and communications is really important. Blogging, being able to communicate effectively to the public what it is you do and why it matters. That's important for scholars as well as non-academics. Um, so thinking about opportunities within the course where students can build in these kinds of distractions um, could actually maybe be really interesting. Um, pulling students into, you know, running and organizing a symposium for dissertation, you know, people to present on their own dissertations could be one thing that students could do. So I think just being really thinking about, I think this is where talking to professionals and even just doing a survey of PhDs in all tax positions on your campus to find out what skills they use um, and, and having conversations with people, you know, who are in those kinds of positions, and then thinking about the ways in which you're building your programs to, and, and just pointing out to the students as you're going through it, like, project management, it's a thing. This is really important, this is what it is. Here's a day where we talk about project management. Now we're actually gonna build project management planning into the dissertation process, so that you don't have to retroactively say you're a project manager, you could actually do project management in writing and finishing your dissertation. This is what it looks like. So there could be ways in which partnering with, again, just the PhDs that are on your campus to build some more things into your program, to make students aware of the types of jobs that are available, the types of skills they're already getting in grad school, and how that sets them up for other types of careers could be really powerful. So my question is about your comment that people aren't availing themselves of the career services. And I'm wondering if one of the, the sets of feedback that you've encountered is that people aren't doing it because that's not who they came to study with, right? PhDs are such mentorship intensive programs sure. that if I came to study with the amazing Noe Montez, why, why would I go over there for career advice, right? I, I came to be Noe, right? That's what I came to the program to model myself after. So that's who I'm looking to, to create my, my array of professional options. Is that something that you've yeah, uh, the stigma on career services is that it's for undergraduates, uh, and the stigma on grads, the grad professional development at grad schools is that it's for STEM. That's that's the stigma, and and some departments are trying to like actually 
or schools are trying to, you know, Duke is a great example of this. Have we had a Duke person? Yeah, Duke is a great example of this. Oh, Duke is a great example of this. They actually have, uh, but they also have a lot of resources. Um, but they have um, started to build up uh, humanities focused and going into departments and partnering with departments at, from the grad school to departments to actually create specific programs that are like, this is for humanities PhDs, only for humanities PhDs. No one but humanities PhDs could possibly benefit from this, only humanities PhDs. Now, that's not true, but that's, you know, that's the approach to take. So I think for departments, don't have the students go to career services. Go to career services, find out what they can do, and bring them to your department. They will be so excited. They'll be so excited to be invited into the department. Um, and sometimes, you know, I would also, I do want to caution on career services. Find out from career services if they do support grad schools. Because there are a lot of career services still that don't have people who are able to support grad students. Um, and so you don't want to have somebody who comes in who primarily works with undergraduates to work with your late 20s, early 30 grad students because it, it won't work. And that's the other thing is that sometimes students go to career, uh, undergraduate focus career centers and they don't get help um, and they tell them to write like one page resumes that take off all their grad work right and it's it's not great um, so you know have those conversations and then see what kind of programs the other place that can often have really good resources is a teaching and learning center um, and we have found that when we talk to the teach like we've talked to teaching and learning centers about this as well as career services and the teaching and learning center is um, a place where students actually do feel like they can go for professional development. So that might be a place if you're going to build up programs to partner with teaching and learning centers because they see that as a place that is for grad students and faculty, not undergraduates. Yeah. Oh yeah. Awesome. I'm the director of graduate career services here. We've, we've exchanged yes, emails. We've, we've yes, we've talked. Um, and that's a new position because we recognize it as a real need for graduate students. And so I think more and more schools, and I'm not sure what your schools do, but check in with your career centers because I think that many of us, even if we're not just, just seeing graduate students, are very adept at seeing graduate students who want to leave academia. I think it's when they want to become faculty members that we tell them to go back and talk to you folks more because you've got that experience. We've never gone through that. But I think that um, more and more schools are really focusing on that and expanding yeah. because of the need. And so. I just want to go back, not just with career services, there, your universities are probably most likely chock full of PhDs working in non-faculty roles. And finding those people and bringing them in to do your resume writing, your workshops, your project management, et cetera. Because again, going back to the teaching thing, like that is something that people miss. So giving them that opportunity to come back into departments on the campus and help build up these programs, even having them sit on your curriculum committees. I know that sounds outrageous, but having them come back in and say like, okay, well, this is my perspective as a working professional in higher education. This is what I think the strengths are. Or this is what I would see. And really take advantage of that talent that's on campus already. Uh, I think is a, it just, it's such an untapped resource by departments, all of these LTACs, and they will tell you they're untapped. And they don't like the fact that they're not included in these conversations because they do feel they have a lot to offer. So like, you don't even have to leave campus to find people who can help you solve this problem. All right, we're at time, so I just want to say thank you to Marin one yeah, more time. Yeah, for sure, this is great. Thank you so much for having me.